There is no Black conservative more polarizing than Candace Owens. With 4 million Instagram followers, 3 million Twitter followers, and 1 million YouTube subscribers, Candace Owens cannot be written off as just another Black conservative. Many are loath to admit that she is the most influential Black female conservative commentator today. Candace's core message that the problems of the Black community are government dependence, lax cultural values, and fatherlessness have been presented in various different ways by different personalities for over 100 years. What makes her different is her emergence in an era where traditional media has been eclipsed by social media and streaming platforms. Unlike any other time in history, everyday Americans can create their own news shows, their own commentary media, and their own networks. Philip L. Graham, former co-owner of the Washington Post, once remarked that journalism is the first rough draft of history. But who writes that first rough draft? And who corrects its errors? The story of Candace Owens should be a cautionary tale about the impact of social media, the dangers of the Internet, and what happens when journalism and the media loses the public's trust. Candace Amber Owens Farmer was born on April 29, 1989, the third of four children. When she was around nine years old, her parents divorced and the family fell on hard times. Feeling the home environment was not good for the children, her grandfather, Robert Owens, took her and her siblings into his home. Born in 1941 in racially segregated North Carolina, Robert Owens' life had not been easy. At age five, he was working on a sharecropping farm with his family to help make ends meet. He often told his grandchildren about the time that the KKK was riding through the neighborhood harassing black citizens. Robert's father had grabbed the family gun and shot back at them. Robert Owens later married his wife Nola, Candace's grandmother, and the couple remained married for 35 years until she passed away in 2013. Robert Owens' life had instilled in him the sense that the only way to achieve success was to live well and work hard. He endeavored to teach his grandchildren the same. Candace describes her upbringing with her grandfather as a period where she was instilled with Christian conservative values while remaining largely unaware of their connections to any particular political party. I'm blessed that my grandfather never raised me to see my skin tone as a handicap. There were never excuses, only chores, hard work, and a 30-minute lecture if you ever tried to abandon either or. I laugh out loud when people question my family and my background. My blackness has never been up for sale, not to the media, not to anyone, not ever. It has always been mine and can never be taken away or questioned. When he retired some years ago, my grandfather went back down to that sharecropping farm, purchased it, and built a house on it. My granddad is the truest example of why America is great and why I fight every day to make sure it stays that way. By 2007, Candace was a student at Stanford High School in Stanford, Connecticut. Candace ran track, was a cheerleader, and had many friends. In her senior year, Candace started dating a new guy and things seemed to be getting serious. The relationship began to take time away from her extracurricular activities and other friends. One person in particular, named Evan Kopik, seemed to take a lot of offense to these changes. On February 1, 2007, Candace and Evan got into a heated argument in class, and as a result of his actions during the exchange, Evan was suspended. Two days later, Candace received threatening and racist voicemails on her phone. The harassers used racial epithets and threatened to burn Candace's house down. When given information about who had attacked Candace, the school said they could not take disciplinary action unless the perpetrators were arrested since the incident occurred off campus. Candace left school for six weeks, unable to deal with seeing her harassers on a daily basis. She returned in March when Evan Kopech and another boy was arrested. Kopech was charged with first-degree harassment and second-degree intimidation by bigotry or bias. His case was eventually sealed due to his age. The NAACP sued the Board of Education on behalf of Candace, stating that the failure to suspend the boys when the incident was reported violated Title IX, which bans discrimination in schools that receive federal funding. It's not clear if the NAACP approached Candace's family to begin the legal effort or if they were asked to intervene. The Board of Education eventually settled out of court without admitting guilt. In an open letter written on March 5, 2016, Candace recalled, 
By some random stroke of misfortune, one of those involved was Governor Daniel Malloy's son, a boy I had never even laid eyes upon. Malloy was mayor of Stanford at the time, and for obvious reasons, the mixture of politics and race proved irresistible to journalists. Soon my face was plastered on the front page of every newspaper across Connecticut, and everyone from the NAACP to Dr. Phil wanted in on the story. Without my consent or involvement, political forces took sides. The NAACP held press conferences outside my high school, which I reluctantly attended. Malloy's political enemy seized the opportunity to criticize him. Within my own family, lines were drawn. My father wanted to press charges. My mother just wanted to keep quiet so I could return to normal life. And all I wanted was an apology. I wanted someone to be accountable, admit they had made a mistake, and just say sorry. But to this day, no one has. The experience of the harassment coupled with the media firestorm that followed left Candace depressed and confused. She talked about the many days she would go home after school and cry due to the gossip among adults and students. She also came to feel that the labeling of this incident as a hate crime and these boys as racist was hyperbolic and wrong. Connecticut, do you remember any of us? I do, and I'll be the first to say I am sorry to all of them for having to endure that experience. A group of children dissected and labeled. Were they wrong? Categorically. Should they have been held accountable for their actions? Undeniably. Did they deserve to be branded by a society? No. After graduating high school, Candace enrolled in Rhode Island University in the fall of 2007 and planned to study journalism. She reportedly used her mother's maiden name at the university to avoid being recognized for what happened at Stanford. In a statement to the CT Post, Candace remarked, It took me seven years to move past it. When something like that happens, you become hostile. You become bitter. I remember not even wanting to use my name. Following this event, and I barely made it to college because of this. It was, I mean, it was like something that was really taxing that happened in my senior year. And following this event, I developed severe anorexia. It's a control mechanism. So when you, I felt like my life was completely out of control and people were basically able to freely say whatever they wanted about me and it was permanently on the internet like this situation that happened and the NAACP filing with politicians and nobody gave a shit about the kids that were involved in this mm. nobody cared about the kids that were involved in this I developed anorexia the I think the ringleader they kept calling him that like had these kids call me had went on to have like DUIs he was like a, a closeted gay at the time everybody's life got ruined by this and it was something that I never wanted and it ate me alive. It just was like, this is it. Like the internet is forever and these things happen. You get to write about them and you get to politicize something that's not true. Candace left college without graduating in 2010 and took a job at Vogue. In 2012, she took a new job at a private equity firm. By 2015, she quit that job to start her own media platform called Degree 180. The goal of the platform was to create, quote, better content for the internet, end quote. Candace would be the company's CEO and Zoe Weiner, a rising beauty and fashion journalist who had been an intern at Vogue during Candace's time there, would be senior editor-in-chief. Candace wanted to change the way discourse unfolded on the internet. The platform hired writers to publish articles about various topics. Candace wrote articles as well. The reason stay-at-home wives tend to be batshit crazy. It took a long time for the rights of women to advance. For centuries upon centuries, our role, irregardless of socioeconomic status, was firmly in the household. This means that if a woman wanted to make anything happen, she had to learn to do so with her mind. We developed traits of mental strategy, manipulation when needed, and an ability to influence our male counterparts without any trace of physicality or aggression. This is why I believe women belong at the tops of companies today, and this is also why I shudder when a man in business informs me that his wife is stay at home. Why I hate women so much. Spoiler alert, I am one. In many ways, and yes, I'm aware this is going to come off as arrogant, I feel that I am the female Kanye West. I totally understood him in his speech at the VMAs this year when he said, I feel like I had to die so other artists could have an opinion. It's true. Kanye West died that night when he jumped up on stage and took that mic from Taylor Swift. It was considered a steep no-no for an artist to speak out against the same system that propelled him to fame, but to do so while offending America's sweetheart? That was political suicide. What Kanye did that night was not only dramatic, it was downright globally offensive. Fast forward to today and Taylor Swift calls Kanye West her best friend, is endorsing him in his bid for presidency in 2020. Why? 
because he died for her too that night. That situation helped her understand that she was a product within a bullshit system and she had to decide upon herself at what price she would be valued at. So too has been my relationship with women, dramatic, globally offensive at times, and I've had to die over and over again continuously in order to get women to see their true worth. I have to leave friends in the dust to incentivize them to look toward my trail. Over the past six years, particularly, I have been repeatedly told by other women two very distinct points about my character. Candace, you're so inspiring. Candace, sometimes you have to realize that being honest is just plain mean. But I never care if what I say offends someone if I'm speaking the truth. Do you want to know what personally offends me? Bullshit. Untruths. The state of business and relationships today. The fact that every time I go into a meeting with a company exec, I'm sitting across the table from a man. We are all ignoring Donald Trump. Dear Mexicans and everyone else offended by Donald Trump's remarks, as an American, I want you to know that as is the case in most countries, people with a public voice many times misrepresent the public. We are not a racist country, and we are all aware that this country was founded by immigrants. We appreciate all of your hard work, and we apologize on behalf of his lost soul. With the exception of Native Americans, of which there are very few remaining, no one has the right to state vicious claim to America. Let's see if we can work together to find a more viable solution to all of these border issues. We hear you and we see you and we want to help you. In addition to longer format articles, some posts were simply screenshots of quotes or pictures that resonated with the writers. Candace often posted screenshots of tweets from Kanye West. One article by Candace was entitled, Kanye Rants Some Truth, which included screenshots of Kanye's tweets from 2013. Candace wrote often about how she felt the media was distorting the population's perceptions. She also embraced some non-mainstream theories around health and wellness. Health warning. What Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation is really doing to your body. I don't think we need a team of scientists from all over the world to tell us that the technological advancements of the last few decades have been dramatically affecting our bodies. But in case you do, here they are. Now here's what's scary. Radiation has a much more drastic effect on children. It's not so funny to see children playing with iPads and iPhones. Educate yourself, listen to your bodies, and make the necessary decisions when you become parents. Know this. Click here to read the article that inspired this post. Ever had an out-of-body experience? I am now one of the people who wholeheartedly and emphatically embraces this sort of research. I have taken it on as a personal study as I practice every night and can now effectively leave my body up to two times a week. It is a life-altering experience that any person in the entire world can train themselves to do. Should you embrace this sort of development, you will conquer your fear of death, increase your awareness of the universe, and push past any mental boundaries you have ever known. Please, please, please click to read this incredible article to learn more about this. In 2016, Candace decided to create another platform called Social Autopsy. The proposal for the site was that it would allow users to submit social media posts anonymously. Then employees, schools, and any others who access the site could search the aggregated post by name. If a person were bullying another person under their real name, anyone could submit them to Social Autopsy where their online messages could be found. Words are real. People don't assign, like, there's no humanity behind what they say. They just think it's not real. And that's what technology takes away from children, the fact that it is real. And you would never in a million years say those things. In March 2016, she spoke about the project. For the last year, I have worked on creating a website, socialautopsy.com, that will stop online bullying by outing the bullies. I create a searchable database of people who spew hate online. I hope it will make people think twice before they exercise their First Amendment rights online as a means to hurt others. Candace started a Kickstarter to raise money for the project and enlisted the help of engineers to begin development. On April 14, 2016, libertarian journalist Kathy Young came across the Kickstarter page and was concerned. Young tweeted about the project, wondering if it was a glorified doxing service. Candace reached out to Young to clarify that social autopsy was not going to be a doxing site. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, doxing is publicly identifying or publishing private information about someone, especially as a form of punishment or revenge. Candace told Young that the first iteration of social autopsy would only accept submissions of posts that contain personal information about the poster within the post itself. 
Social autopsy would not research posts to uncover the identity of people who could not be identified within a post. Candace also assured Kathy that the platform would not reveal the identity of anonymous submitters. Young quoted Candace as saying this ability could be added in the future and that Owens didn't see a problem with revealing the identity of users that posted threats online. Once Young spoke to Candace and understood the true intention of the platform, she took down her tweet. By that time, it was too late. Before Young had even posted her tweet, others had seen the Kickstarter page and were raising concerns. Unbeknownst to Candace, she had wandered into a confusing, complex debate about anonymity and free speech on the internet. This controversy was called Gamergate. Most say Gamergate began on August 16, 2014, when Aaron Joni posted several blog posts about his ex-partner Zoe Quinn. Quinn is a game developer and activist who created a text-based game called Depression Quest. The game, based on Quinn's own experience with mental health issues, received positive reception from many gaming news outlets. Others in the largely male gaming community were not as enthused. They thought the technological interface of the game, as well as the story writing, were not advanced enough to warrant such critical praise. Aaron's blog post chronicled their relationship, which began on an online dating site and ended when he discovered that Quinn had cheated on him with Quinn's married boss. Screenshots of social media exchanges show Quinn did not know the boss was married when the relationship started and that Quinn did not want the relationship to go public for fear of how it could be misconstrued. Aaron goes on to say in the blog that he believes Quinn had cheated on him with numerous other people, some of whom also work in the game industry. The post was seized upon by members of the gaming community as an explanation for why Quinn had achieved success so easily in the industry. Though Aaron never directly said it, for many he was implying that Quinn had exchanged sex for personal favors. Quinn was harassed, threatened, doxxed, and swatted. Swatting is the act of creating a host 911 call, typically involving hostages, gunfire, or other acts of extreme violence, with the goal of diverting emergency public safety resources to an unsuspecting person's residence. Um, but the, the sadder part for me was going through and seeing all of these institutions that were in name supposed to be the sort of thing that is there to help um, completely fumble and fumble spectacularly and usually contribute to the problem. Uh, I had to deal with too, mon- uh, too many pe- members of the press just simply reporting on the false accusation that I had, if you actually look at what would have taken this for this to be true, that I had traveled back in time to sleep with a game reviewer for that worked for a website I had already written for, so I co- obviously could not have gotten that connection any other way, slept with him to get a review of my game that never existed, and the game was also free. <laughs> And also, why did I set my target for Kotaku and not like the New York Times or something? Whatever. <laughs> Basically, I'm a time traveling hoe is uh, more or less what the, the chief accusation came down to and is up there with the other accusations about the numerous people that I've supposedly murdered, uh, that I am a treasonous person that should be tried under the Logan Act, which is really funny if you know anything about that, um, and that I am actually a vampire. <laughs> like there, was, there are some people that think I am actually a vampire. It's great. Those ones are more fun. But seeing the fact that so many members of the media would just report on this instead of saying like, oh, she was accused of of having sex for reviews and then not following that up and just spreading the misinformation. It's like you could finish the sentence and say that it never happened. The never happened part seems kind of important, but (laughs) who, who, what do I know? I'm just a time traveling vampire hoe. Critics of Gamergate said that it emerged out of the misogynistic, violent, and racist aspects of the gaming community, which had existed for years. Disaffected men who had found solace in gaming would convene on social sites like 4chan and Reddit and share controversial memes and posts. The men in these communities blamed double standards created by feminism and activism by so-called social justice warriors for failures in their personal lives and degradation of the gaming world. Internet-only trolling often devolved into in-person harassment and threats once a target, like a prominent feminist gaming journalist, was identified. Defenders of the movement stated that its primary concern was journalistic integrity in the gaming industry. They stated that interpersonal relationships between gamers and game reviewers were a conflict of interest that threatened to penalize those creators without the right connections. They also remarked how political correctness and wokeness was censoring game content and threatening the careers of prominent people for small offenses. Because both sides of the debate dovetail with other movements, it was increasingly difficult to disentangle a clear motive in either. Opponents of Gamergate were leftist social justice advocates and mainstream liberals 
who sometimes advocated for censorship using categories that were nebulously broad. This pretty much ensured that some less dangerous individuals with unpopular opinions would be caught in their net. Supporters of Gamergate included so-called men's rights activists, incels or involuntary celibate men, members of the Manosphere, members of the alt-right, and mainstream conservatives. The dangerous and violent elements of this side used the more moderate voices in the issue of journalistic ethics as cover for their actions. Members of both sides are far more technologically savvy than members of law enforcement, politicians, corporate executives, and most members of the public. Both opponents and supporters of Gamergate are able to leverage their knowledge to influence corporations, law enforcement, and government agencies against those they disagree with. But this doesn't mean that both sides should be viewed as equally dangerous. We have seen several examples of mass shooters linked to incel, alt-right, and right-wing spaces. There may be those who have real concerns about ethics and journalism, but it's clear that there are more violent elements hiding behind that banner. When assessing how to identify those violent people before they harm others, the solutions are not clear. In the chaos of Gamergate, Zoe Quinn became a prominent online bullying activist and started an organization called Crash Override Network. Quinn also self-identifies as patient zero of Gamergate, the first victim of the harassment the movement would employ against many others. Candace told her story of how she first met Zoe Quinn in a blog post posted on Degree 180 on April 18, 2016. On April 12, 2016, Zoe Quinn sent a direct message on Twitter to the Degree 180 account, requesting a good email address for the head of social autopsy. Surprisingly, though she was crowdfunding for an online bullying platform, Candace had never heard of Zoe, Gamergate, or even the term doxing. My idea was big and little at the same time. I wanted to put an end to the era of internet thugging. It is something I've genuinely never understood how people so recklessly utilize the web to invoke terror upon others. I had examined the correlation between the rising rate of suicides in teenagers over the years and knew that, even if it was never going to be explicitly stated, the age of social media had contributed significantly to its dark rise. I had experienced it myself when I was in high school 10 years earlier. All we had then was Facebook, but the writing was on the wall even then. I was involved in an incident that was labeled a hate crime and exposed as a victim to just how awful the cyber world could be for both the victims and the accused. In an email, Zoe explained past expertise in the anti-bullying activism space and her opposition to social autopsy. She requested a phone call to speak further and Candace reluctantly agreed. On the phone, Zoe detailed a series of concerns. First, Zoe was concerned that the platform could be used to dox minors. In the week six, Candace published the creation of social autopsy in the Connecticut press and requested input from several anti-bullying organizations. Candace had never heard this term. Still, Candace explained that phone numbers and addresses would not be included in the database. Only information publicly available on someone's social media profile would be included. She also told Zoe that there were no minors in the database as of that date. Secondly, Zoe told Candace she was concerned that vigilantes would use social autopsy to identify bullies and harass them. To this, Candace explained that the search options on the site would not allow users to locate data indiscriminately. Users could only search by first and last name. In other words, they would need to already know who they were looking for. Next, Zoe asked Candace about whether collecting this data was even legal. Candace told Zoe that during research for the platform, they had contacted Facebook's legal team to understand what data could be legally used from the site. From Candace's point of view, all of the issues Zoe was raising had already been addressed. But Candace perceived that Zoe was becoming frustrated by Candace's unwillingness to stop the project altogether. She told me she knew those people were not bad people, that she herself had been a part of the online group Anonymous, and that it was really just something they did. She explained that she would never want the people that harassed her listed anywhere and that she knew the first and last name of some of them and yet had never reported them. Candace found this information strange. She couldn't understand how someone who claimed to be against online harassment could simultaneously claim that online harassers were not bad people and they didn't want their identities known. So it also told Candace that supporters of Gamergate did not like the site and would come after Candace. So we wanted Candace to pull the project. After thousands of hours of work and dollars and in investment, Candace refused. 
Candace tried to assure Zoe that despite any issues which may arise, she and the team were confident they would have everything rectified before the site went live. The call allegedly ended with Zoe crying and saying, by then it will be too late. It'll ruin everything. About an hour after the call ended, Candace decided to send Zoe a polite follow-up email. She didn't understand why Zoe had reacted so strongly to a project which at that point was simply a splash page and a small Kickstarter campaign. However, she believed that she and Zoe were essentially on the same side. This is when things took a further left turn. Candace claims that about 45 minutes after she sent her follow-up email, the social autopsy Kickstarter page was bombarded with hateful, threatening, and negative comments. Before speaking with Zoe, the page had no more than 10 positive comments. Suddenly, there were over 100 negative comments. The Kickstarter private messages were also suddenly receiving spam comments. The names of the senders were clearly fake. My initial suspicion was that Zoe perhaps tipped the gaming community off and they were now coming down on us hard. Candace also received a menacing email to her personal email address. Her email address was also used to sign up for two pornography sites. The use of her personal email in these attacks stood out to Candace. She expected that negative messages would come to the Kickstarter account if Zoe had, in fact, tipped off others to bring down the campaign. But there was only one person who had recently been given her personal email address. This person was also against social autopsy. In a response to Candace's email, Zoe didn't respond directly to anything Candace had written previously. Instead, Zoe alerted Candace that the demo site her team had created had security flaws which were easily exploitable. At this, Candace could not contain her confusion or her anger. The situation continued to spiral out of control. As Candace tried to fight back against rumors that the site was going to be used to dox minors, her detractors were spreading the same rumor to parenting organizations, Kickstarter, and even the FBI. Within 48 hours of being published, the social autopsy Kickstarter page was going viral and not in a positive way. Candace contacted the Kickstarter to explain what she believed had happened. She shared the email correspondence between her and Zoe. At first, they told her they understood and would keep the Kickstarter up. But eventually, with all the bad publicity, Kickstarter took the campaign down. On April 15, 2016, online activist Randy Lee Harper posted an open letter about social autopsy. During the height of Gamergate, Harper had been a frequent defender of Zoe Quinn and was attacked online as a result. Harper also acts as an activist in online gaming and anti-bullying spaces. I'm giving you this free advice after you decided to publicly shit on Zoe after she tried to talk to you about your platform. Going to Twitter to talk about it immediately afterwards on social autopsy account is shady as hell. I see that you deleted the tweet, so I'll remind you of the content. You stated that some Gamergate woman was being aggressive, that she didn't understand what you were doing, and that she started crying on the phone because she was so upset. This is gross. Why would you make a private conversation where she was trying to help you public? You then proceeded to state that she was leading Gamergate and that she's the cause of all the harassing messages you've received. That's right. The person that was the original target of the most publicly known online harassment mob. The woman that made Forbes 30 under 30 list for her fantastic work in creating Crash Override, a resource for victims of online harassment try to patiently give you free advice because we all want to be helpful for new people that are trying to create online harassment solutions. In return, you sent a flurry of tweets with the Gamergate hashtag talking about your conversation, blamed your harassment on her and told Kathy Young that she was bullying you. You are a fucking idiot. The letter goes on to detail Harper's problems with the idea of social autopsy. Like Quinn, Harper's primary concerns were the risk to children being doxxed and how the site planned to verify data submitted to them. In further defense of Quinn, she wrote, Zoe, a well-known activist and anti-harassment work founder, called you to give you free advice. She knows as well as I do how this platform is going to be exploited, but you chose to ignore her. You told her that she wasn't supporting you, and then you went to the group that's been targeting her and violated her confidentiality while talking about how you were being bullied by her. You then proceeded to blame the harassment you were getting from that group on her. What the fuck? But the most important portion of this letter, as far as Candace was concerned, was the last paragraph. You blamed your Kickstarter getting shut down on trolls? 
you're wrong. That was us. As long as you're willfully harming other people by creating shitty, uninformed products while kicking the shit out of anyone that tries to help you, we're going to keep getting you shut down. You've created more work for me in the past three days, but I'd rather invest this time now because if this bullshit doesn't get nipped in the butt early, it's just another fucking platform I'm going to have to try to help protect people from in the future. There it was, Candace thought, an admission. All of this, the threatening emails, the Kickstarter shutdown, the numerous negative blog posts being written about social autopsy. Candace believed that all of it was caused by Zoe Quinn. But how could she prove it? In order to do that, Candace devised a plan. She posted a message on Twitter announcing that she would be releasing all of the harassing emails and that she knew who was behind them, Zoe Quinn. Once Candace sent off that tweet, she said something remarkable happened. The harassing emails stopped. Candace wrote in her blog that the messages which had been coming in since everything went viral stopped for an entire weekend after she named Zoe Quinn as the culprit on Twitter. This seemed to confirm Candace's suspicions. The only thing left was, why? Why would someone want to do all of this? Why would a supposed anti-cyberbullying activist want to shut down a site which would reveal bullies? Why would that person be so desperate to do so that they would resort to harassment tactics themselves? If a company was coming out and said in their crowdfunding video, what we are doing is figuratively lifting the mask off of trolls, you could inundate Kickstarter with email complaints about minors and make them believe they were involved in something dirty. What you could do is control people's perception. What is the valuation of that? You could fiend friends, fiend your own support, and exaggerate your own presence and significance. Yes, if you were willing to spend full time dedicated to the web, you could begin to distort reality by presenting an assumed majority. You could create different personas, thereby infiltrating certain communities. And if a company like Social Autopsy developed a technology to unmask you, it would ruin everything, literally. So far, most of the drama around Social Autopsy had occurred on Twitter, Reddit forums, and email. But soon the story bubbled up and major news organizations started calling. The New York Magazine's Jesse Single wrote a piece about social autopsy on April 18th, 2016. Candace claimed that Jesse not only tried to stall to prevent her from publishing a blog post about how the Kickstarter campaign was taken down, but also misled her about how the contents of her interviews with him would be used. She also alleged that he repeatedly tried to get information from her about her allegations against Quinn and Harper, which she believed he intended to share with them. The Washington Post had planned to run a story on social autopsy, but this was canceled after Candace alleged that journalist Caitlin Dewey had lied to bullying organizations about Candace's statements. Caitlin had asked Candace to provide a list of organizations which she had spoke to in preparation for the Kickstarter launch, but Candace refused to answer, fearing those organizations would be subject to internet harassment. After that conversation, it seemed that Caitlin called some anti-bullying organizations at random and by chance selected one which Candace was in fact working with. Caitlin's goal was to get quotes from established organizations which would shed a negative light on the idea of a site like Social Autopsy. But it looks like Caitlin didn't tell the organization she had selected them through her own research. Instead, she allegedly told them that Candace had given their names. In a blog post about the interaction, Candace recounts crying on the phone with a contact at one organization who was upset because they believed Candace had given their name to reporters. Candace insisted that she had not. The Washington Post eventually dropped the story when Candace wrote emails pointing out what allegedly had occurred. As Candace, a former journalism major, began to feel increasingly lied to and tricked by mainstream left-leaning publications she had once looked up to, at least one right-leaning publication was telling her story from her perspective. On April 27, 2016, Breitbart News published a story about the social autopsy fiasco. Unlike the New York Magazine story, which cast Candace as a naive, uninformed, former harassment victim who was falsely blaming two innocent activists, Breitbart accepted Candace's interpretation of events, that the harassing emails were orchestrated by Quinn. There have been right-wing and left-wing critics of social autopsy because both sides had concerns that it would ruin internet anonymity. But as Candace focused her ire on Quinn and Harper, many on the right side of politics began to take her side. They embraced Candace's narrative as yet another example of Quinn and feminists in general manipulating the media for their own gain. 
Candace had, in fact, been very unaware of the world she was entering into. However, this is understandable given the form of bullying she was focused on combating. At high schools across the country in the early 2000s, administrators were confronted with off-campus cyberbullying, characterized by students bullying other students they knew via texting, websites, and chat rooms. This is a type of harassment that happened to Candace in high school. At least one of her harassers was known to her and was a former friend and had been suspended for disruptive conduct towards Candace, which occurred on campus just days before she received the harassing phone calls. During this era, schools would often report that they could not legally take disciplinary action for conduct that happened off campus or for conduct that didn't involve physical violence. This scenario was depicted in several made-for-TV movies and after-school specials developed to highlight the issue. Sadly, cyberbullying would claim the lives of several students until school policies began to catch up with technology. I am so proud of you. Great work, baby. <laughs> nice job, Nessa. All right. Best friends? Best friends. That's one thing we don't need to stress about. Did you see how Nessa flirted with Tony? She was all over him. Doesn't she know he's yours? Do you want to go out sometime? There's plenty of room over there. That food has to weigh a ton. Don't make it sound harmless, though. I'm sorry, but in the absence of violence, there's nothing much we can do. A solution like social autopsy would be an imperfect but well-meaning attempt to address this form of bullying. By 2016, technology had continued to evolve at lightning speed, and the most insidious form of bullying was anonymous cyber harassment. As Randy Harper detailed in her open letter, these cyber harassers often target people they don't know personally. They use their sophisticated technological knowledge to weaponize government agencies, law enforcement, and private corporations against someone. This form of bullying is much more difficult to prevent and stop. Attackers can create thousands of untraceable accounts in minutes. They can disguise their real location. And while this type of harassment is damaging enough when done online, it doesn't always result in someone physically showing up to harm someone, meaning that law enforcement finds it even more difficult to identify individuals and charge them. When Quinn and Harper interacted with Owens, they seemed insulted that she was unaware of how things had changed online. Candace didn't know about their accomplishments, cyberbullying terminology, or the flaws in social autopsies use cases. Accustomed to being the authority figures on the topic of cyberbullying, I can believe they spoke to Candace condescendingly and expected her to defer to their judgment. When Candace seemed unimpressed and unmoved by Quinn's demands, Quinn clearly didn't take it well. In Kathy Young's article on the social autopsy controversy posted on May 1st, 2016, she writes of the activists, I also think it's entirely plausible that Harper and Quinn regarded Owens as an interloper on their turf, which does not negate the fact that they also had justified criticisms of her project. Initiatives against internet harassment have been almost entirely owned by the social justice faction in the culture wars, and Owens is clearly not part of that clique. It's even possible that Quinn and Harper may dislike Owens' proposed online bullies registry because they may realize particularly Harper, that they may end up in it themselves, not for anything they do in secret, but for their public behavior. Harper openly states her concern that social autopsy may improperly classify people as harassers when they respond to harassment, which is no doubt how she sees her verbally abusive posts. Did Quinn send those emails to Owens? Perhaps we will never know definitively. It is suspicious that a warning email will be sent to Candace's personal email address. I believe that screenshots of Candace's emails could have been shared with others who disagreed with social autopsy, thereby leaking Candace's email. All of the events definitely had an impact on Candace. After what she had been through in high school and now with social autopsy, she felt she understood the root cause of the problem. In a video called The Truth About Your Activism, posted on October 20th, 2016, Candace talks about how internet activism has replaced genuine activism by allowing people to feel that they have helped a cause without actually having to put their real identities or bodies on the line. After causing trending topics and viral moments, most online activists never really know the effects of what they have done, who has been helped, or who has been hurt. School, defending me against all of the chatter that was drummed up by students and teachers alike, because as we all know, in any of these types of situations, everyone feels a need to take a side. And maybe Candace made up the voice messages. Maybe she called herself. No one had been arrested yet. It was just an investigation. 
I made the decision then to start homeschooling while the investigation continued, and it concluded nearly two months later. It took two months before all of the boys involved were arrested and before I was able to return back to school and my hashtag was allowed to shift into the societal subconscious. And then of course, everyone forgot about my story. Everyone except for me, because a few months later I started college and I couldn't rid my brain of all of those articles that I had read online about me and all the things that I had read in the comment sections about myself. I was naturally terrified that incoming freshman students that could potentially be my friend would discover these articles and form presumptive hashtags about my character. And I certainly didn't want them to think that I was a hashtag race baiter or that I was hashtag trouble or hashtag anything else. But I couldn't control the internet. What I did, however, discover was that I could control my body and I began manifesting that experience through severe anorexia, a disease that would stick with me for the next five years. This is a photo that was taken of me three years later in 2010 and I went on to lose about 10 pounds after it was taken. And if I am being completely honest on this stage right now, I remember my anorexia very dearly. I had an affectionate relationship with it. It was very hard for me to let it go because it was my best friend for five years. It gave me control of my life back. I felt somehow that with every calorie that I avoided, I was also avoiding the problems from my past. And those problems retrospectively could have been solved if somebody had just said sorry and taken responsibility for what happened, which never happened. It's an incredibly interesting afterthought to have that our digital activism over these perceived acts of inhumanity can itself become the act of inhumanity. That as a society, we tend to drum up these hurricanes to combat what may initially have just been a storm. That's because the method of activism has morphed completely. When our parents and our grandparents were coming up, that word required a physical presence. They had to march on the front lawns of the White House to put an end to the Vietnam War. They had to risk their livelihoods to put an end to institutions like segregation. Activism meant maybe being arrested. Activism meant maybe being killed. So they had to care deeply beyond the concept of a trending hashtag to voice their outrage. But today we have the internet. And the internet is fast, and the internet is amazing, but doesn't exactly require a physical presence and it therefore allows us a level of detachment. In 2017, Candace took down all of her old YouTube videos and changed the name of the account to Red Pill Black. This parody video of her coming out as a conservative went viral and gained hundreds of thousands of views. There are some theories that Candace's success posting conservative content was due to family connections or that Candace was simply copying content from other conservatives that she thought would garner her attention. Certainly her content didn't contain anything new. The talking points have been publicized by many other conservatives over the years. But what made Candace's videos different was that she was posting at a time of extreme polarization and high levels of social media engagement. Discussions of journalistic integrity in the gaming world aligned with larger conversations about media coverage and bias happening nationwide. Donald Trump, a billionaire cultural icon and reality TV star, galvanized supporters by calling out what he called fake news, giving a name to what many conservatives believed was a biased liberal media monopoly. Candace, a person who had a background in journalism and at least two experiences with social media outrage culture, was poised to seize this moment and rise to the top of conservative media. And it wouldn't be long before others in the conservative world would take notice. After several viral videos, Candace was offered a job as communications director at Turning Point USA, a conservative political organization. She was also invited on many conservative platforms like InfoWars, Dave Rubin, and even Fox News. Candace was quickly becoming an important voice in Trump-age conservatism. 
Like Trump, Candace was not concerned with political correctness, backlash, or outrage. When interviewed, she gave her views directly with no filter, often going viral on social media, which made her a favorite of conservative news outlets and press. But with all of this attention, Candace would once again find herself in the middle of controversy with people who she expected to be on her side. When trying to launch social autopsy, she had said that leftists attacked her, spread rumors, and ultimately got the project shelved. Now in 2017, she would have to face her critics from the right. Many conservatives were questioning her sincerity and believed she was nothing more than an opportunist. They were leery of people who had previously rejected Trump, but were now saying they were supporters after he became president. And it didn't take much digging for them to find Candace's old blog, tweets, and articles. Conservative commentators like Blair White and Tree of Logic were confused as to how Candace could emerge seemingly from nowhere, be fully employed in conservative organizations, and be featured on conservative news platforms, while many other conservatives, including Black conservatives, had been advocating from the political right for years and had received far less fanfare. Debates on YouTube and Twitter erupted as people publicized portions of Candace's past. Some of those conservative critics of social autopsy reemerged to voice their concerns over Owen's involvement in the Kickstarter campaign. It's like a, a no-no type of a punishment. Like maybe it's held for, for three months and everybody, like all of these schools, we were meeting with principals of schools, of high schools, before we even decided what we wanted to do, to say, how can we help? What would be helpful? What do kids care about? Well, they care about being on the football team, right? What if you said, you're on, you're on social autopsy, all these schools have this program. You said this to Carolina, whatever it is. Now you don't get to try out for the football team. Something that's like petty. Boxing website would be, I'm publicly, I'm using this site to release information about people. This but, but you're saying basically this was was going to be a archive. Uh, an archive home for schools to look at this information right. and sift through it. Okay. So I think calling it an archive, I mean, it literally is an archive, but it's also a doxing website. Anytime you publish people's personal information, it is doxing. It's not personal information. Why not? Because it was public. Because it was on Facebook. It, it, that's still the definition of doxing. If you share someone else's. No, it's not. If you share someone. No, it's not. You can't you, change the definition of doxing. Hold if on, you, hold on. I actually have the definition right here. Good. If you share someone else's personal information without their consent, it is doxing. Especially when it so comes Google to kids. So Google doxes everyone? Especially when, no, I'll, I'll finish. Especially when it comes to kids. I mean, she's definitely playing the whole like wanting to protect kids thing which I think honestly your heart could have very well been in the right place but the reality is when you aggregate information of children and you attach it to where they go to school which was the intent of your website in fact you actually said that it was the best time to be on the website if you were a child because it teaches you can you slow I, I literally can't follow it was you, right a, you said that it was the best time to be on your website when you're a child because it teaches them responsibility of what they say online right we said that in a video, you there are not, you know, no harm, no foul. We didn't want to come out and say, we're never going to put a minor on here because again, the whole reason I thought of the idea was because of what happened to me when I was a minor. Well, so, it's actually so, illegal to even put their, the child's information on there. There was no children. It, so this it, is like a, no, a fantasy no, conversation no, right It's now. not a fantasy conversation. It was your intent. So that's what, that's what you don't really understand. You think that because the website didn't actually come to fruition that people still don't have a right to criticize that's exactly the idea what I of think. it. That's, that's exactly what you think. But regardless, right. you made it very clear that your intent was to put that information on your website. It actually violates the Children, Children's Internet Protection Act. So it was illegal. So that's why your Kickstarter was actually <laughs> All right, wait, hold on. So, there so were, let's pause there for a second. There were no children. Critiques from the left side of the political spectrum were able to prevent her from becoming a success in liberal media. The attempts to stop Candace's rise on the right, however, failed. In April of 2018, Kanye West tweeted his praise of Candace. This was likely a dream come true for the woman who at one time had called herself the female Kanye West. And on May 9, 2018, Donald Trump, at the time the President of the United States, endorsed her on Twitter. Candace registered as a Republican in 2018. That same year, she started an organization named Blexit, whose goals were to help black voters leave the, quote, Democrat plantation, end quote, and vote for the Republican Party. On August 31st, 2019, Candace married British conservative George Farmer. They now have two children. When most people talk about the harassment Candace endured in high school, their goal is to highlight her hypocrisy. Candace has, at times, harshly critiqued the NAACP without inserting any nuance for the history of the organization and helping victims who fully consented to pursue legal recourse. In Candace's case, she did not consent, and she has chosen to believe that the harm she experienced during the media and legal circus was intentional. The compassion she has for the boys who harassed her does not extend to the other human beings 
who were doing their best to help her, albeit in mistaken and in flawed ways. The people who talk about this incident also fail to acknowledge the harm of the media exposure and not only the harassment. Many of these critics would agree with concepts like restorative justice and reconciliation. These are processes which allow victims to pursue healing and closure outside of the legal system and perhaps be able to move forward without a lifelong label. For some, being called a victim is merely an acknowledgement that they are not to blame for what happened to them. For others like Candace, the label fixes them to the one moment in time they would like nothing more than to forget. Since she couldn't control how her story was told online, she thought creating a platform like Social Autopsy would help her to change the story's ending. Instead of the girl who was harassed, run out of town, and never seen again, she would be the woman who took her pain and channeled it into helping kids. The irony of the fallout around social autopsy is that Quinn and Candace were advocating for the same thing. In the same way that Candace did not want the entire lives of people to be defined by one moment in their life, so too did Quinn want to advocate for better tools to combat online bullying without compromising the ability of the world to engage anonymously without fear that their worst online behavior would follow them forever. It's hard to imagine what Quinn and Harper endured as threats descended upon them based on rumors over which they had no control. After already overcoming barriers in the gaming industry, they channeled their horrific experiences into tools and resources which could help others. But by rallying their supporters to attack Candace's Kickstarter, they exposed her to the same type of attacks they had been subject to themselves. Their intentions to protect anonymity and children online could not constrain the actions of thousands of angry people on the internet, a lesson they had learned too well. And regardless of the naivete of Candace's concept, she was under no obligation to shelve her idea upon being contacted by Zoe Quinn, and Quinn was not the final arbiter of which cyberbullying solutions should be created. This was an opportunity for collaboration where two professionals could have helped a woman who was just starting out in the tech industry. Instead, it became a turf war over who would be the face of cyberbullying prevention. In the midst of the controversy, reporters seemed committed to writing articles which protected the image of Quinn and Harper, but never questioned the motives and methods of the pair. Kathy Young is one of the few reporters who even mentioned a past incident where Quinn allegedly rallied her supporters to shut down another gaming-related business idea with which Quinn disagreed. Unable to take control of her own story on the left, Candace found solace on the right, which was all too glad to take up her cause. Conservatives abandoned their initial stance against social autopsy for an opportunity to win a battle against their long-standing liberal rivals. No doubt Candace saw an opportunity as well, her articles excoriating Quinn, Harper, Single, and Dewey were her most commented blog post. By the time the right began to suspect they had allowed an opportunist into their ranks, it was too late. Experienced salesman and media mogul Donald Trump saw something special in Candace, and it didn't matter that she was a former critic of him or a former liberal. Her charisma, wit, and beauty were a perfect package to promote the conservative message to a new generation. The principal critiques from the free speech libertarian right were not enough to eject her from a conservative movement which desperately needed her. And like the motives of her leftist critics, the motives of Candace's conservative critics were mixed. Their commitment to protecting internet anonymity and free speech was tinged with resentment that Candace was getting so much success so fast. These two incidents shaped Candace, but they didn't force her into conservatism. Her personal conservatism began with her time in her grandfather's household. These events were an opportunity for her to connect her upbringing with a political conservatism which was realigning on the national level around the issues of news media. Even when she was a liberal, Candace was never satisfied with the mainstream narrative. As a conservative, she embraced the same mindset. Today, she has learned to use the media's tactics against itself. The outrage and attention machine that had been directed at her in the past is one that she has expertly leveraged to build her platform. Now she is in control. Unlike the intent of Degree 180, Candace's current work is not meant to be a corrective for the unethical, nepotistic media outlets, but a combatant to them. She and other conservatives have created their own tools for protecting their activists, their public figures, and their policy objectives, just like their liberal adversaries. It's too late for the media to take Candace Owens down. Too late to destroy what it created. She's taken the rough draft of her story away from them, 
and rewrote it with new heroes, new villains, and new truths. <laughs>